preface what I'm about to share with you by saying this. I don't make it my normal habit, you know, as, as a believer or as a minister, uh, to go and seek out everyone's prophetic word for the new year. I just don't make that my personal habit because I like to keep my, my spirit clear where I can hear perhaps what God would, would want to share with me uh, that I may relate to the people to whom I minister. Uh, so, so I don't make it my normal habit. But uh, in saying that, uh, something was brought to my attention by my daughter, actually, Madison. She subscribes to various uh, uh, ministry mailing lists. And back in December, uh, she said, Dad, I got a, uh, a newsletter from Mr. Rick Renner today. Uh, he was uh, commenting on the year of 2024. She said, I think you may find it significant. Well, actually, she was just prodding me so that I could, uh, you know, avail myself to something the Spirit of God actually wanted me to read. And so how many of you are familiar with Rick Renner? Uh, many of you would be. Anyway, Mr. Renner, you know, has made a tremendous impact on the nation of, of Russia. And then also, uh, you know, he's a prolific uh, writer, author, Greek, Hebrew scholar. Uh, he's well grounded in the scripture. And so, you know, he's someone that I, I have confidence in. Uh, because as we, as we know, there's a lot of nonsense out there. But he's someone that I do have a lot of confidence in. And so uh, he was relaying this story that he and his wife, Denise, were going uh, on a particular ministry trip. And they were on uh, an airplane in flight. He had purposed in his heart while he was on that flight to be prayerful and to be listening to the Spirit of God uh, as to anything that the Lord may wish for him to share uh, with his friends and partners or the segments of the body of Christ to whom he would be ministering in the year of 2024. And he said, as they were in, in flight, the pilot came on and said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, there's going to be some turbulence ahead. He said, we will arrive safely, but I need you to remain in your seats and to keep your seatbelts fastened. So he said, upon hearing those words, the Spirit of God spoke up on the inside of him and spoke these words. He said, the year of 2024 will be visited with turbulent episodes. Now, how many of you know what an episode is? An episode is an event or a series of events that are a part of an overall sequence. So that doesn't mean that it's just going to be like, no, turbulent episodes, right? So an event here, 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 there, there. And so the Spirit of God said uh, there will be turbulent episodes across the entire globe, uh, particularly in the realm of finance, politics, and in the nation. These episodes will be of a sort that could potentially cause those who are not rooted firmly in God's word to be deeply disturbed. But for those of us who stay in faith, in peace, in love, and in fellowship, and continue sowing our seeds for the sake of eternity, excuse me, they will experience a supernatural power that will cause them to be unmoved, unshaken, well provided for, and to walk in a much needed sense of divine assurance, peace, power, and supernatural victory. Yes, those who stay in faith, in peace, in love, and in fellowship, and continue sowing their seeds for the sake of eternity, they will be blessed. They will be empowered, they will be joy-filled and sustained. And they will miraculously thrive even if the world around them seems tossed with a great tempest. Amen. So, you know, when God speaks to you and I as, as believers, as members of the body of Christ through appointed vessels, giving us insight into the times and seasons in which we're living and potentially things to come, he doesn't do it to instill a sense of fear or uncertainty or to get us on the defensive. 
right? He simply uh, does that in order to make us aware so that we incline ourselves uh, more intently to his presence, his word, his leading, his influence, so that our paths and our decisions and our directives are more accurately influenced by him and so that we can remain in a position as stated here in this prophetic word uh, where we walk in divine assurance, peace, power, supernatural victory, even if the world is in great turmoil. Isn't it wonderful to know <laughs> that no matter what may unfold in this world, you and I are safe in the hands of God. God said in Isaiah 41 in verse 10, he said, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. What will he do? I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Here's another good one. Proverbs 10 and 25. I knew I shouldn't have eaten that donut out there, but I did. <clears throat> The wicked are blown away by every stormy wind. But when a catastrophe comes, the lovers of God have a secure anchor. That's you and me. Woo! Somebody say glory. So, Brother Marty, with all of that said, what is your personal expectation uh, for the year of 2024? Well, my expectation, and I hope likewise will be yours, is to be uh, what the word of the Lord declared, which uh, is to be blessed, empowered, joy-filled, sustained, and miraculously thrive, even if the world around me is tossed with a great tempest. How's that going to be realized? By once again, staying in faith, in love, in peace, in fellowship. And continuing to sow my seed for the sake of eternity. It's very comforting to me, and I, I know likewise to you, uh, that no matter what may unfold in this world, God has given us what we need, we sang about it as believers, uh, to successfully overcome and navigate any situations that may arise. We've been equipped. So this morning, you know, thinking about staying in faith, it just seemed good to me to revisit an Old Testament story. Uh, it's actually from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We won't look there at this moment because I want to give you a little preface. But, <clears throat> you know, we take for granted that people know the Old Testament stories. We, I was a traditional denominational, uh, you know, member growing up. In our Baptist church, man, we read... These Old Testament stories, they told us about David and Goliath. They told us about Samuel. They, you know, but, you know, we assume that everyone's read them, and I'm sure you have. And this particular story you've probably read many times. Uh, but we're going to look at it so that we make sure that as we begin to navigate this year, uh, that uh, we uphold some of the principles set forth in this Old Testament story and that we stay in faith. Everybody say in faith. Now, in, in 2 Chronicles 19, just to give you a little preface of the, of the situation, you know, Jehoshaphat had, of course, aligned himself with uh, Ahab, who was the king of Israel. Ahab was very evil in the sight of God. He was married to Jezebel. They had erected all kind of idolatrous altars in the land of Israel. And uh, uh, Jehoshaphat had actually... Uh, you know, aligned himself with Ahab. So the prophet Jehu comes in and rebukes him and chastises him for his conduct. And he humbled himself and he repented and he realigned himself with God and he set things right in the land of Judah. And this is where we pick up now with uh, this story in 2 Chronicles 20, beginning in verse 1. It happened after this, after he's realigned now, that the people of Moab and the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. You know, sometimes uh, we, as believers, we have aligned ourselves with God 
or in Jehoshaphat's case, realign themselves. And man, we're seeking God, we're endeavoring to serve Him, we're doing all that we can uh, to, to please and to seek His face, and uh, we're in alignment with Him. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves facing uh, perhaps unexpected situations, obstacles, adversity, resistance. This was the situation that was unfolding here. And you know, as a New Testament believer, we can sometimes ask ourselves the questions, why? Why? Well, the reality is all of us will face battles, and I use the term battle because of the context of this story. But all of us will face adverse situations, obstacles, resistance, uh, at times, challenges to our faith. Jesus himself told us, he said, listen, now in, in this world, uh, you're going to have, as the scripture terms, tribulation, some adversity, some oppositions, right? Why? Well, because this world is in a state of degeneration, right? And, and so in John 16 and 33, as you well know, Jesus said, these things have I spoken to you that in me you might have peace. Guys, there is no peace anywhere else, in anything else, or anyone else, but in Him. In me, you might have peace. Now, he goes on to say, in the world, you'll experience some tribulation. But, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So, we understand. There will be some oppositions, potentially some unexpected situations arise because we have an enemy. Friends, Satan is not a fabrication of someone's imagination. He is a real entity. He oversees a vast kingdom of darkness comprised of principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. The scripture identifies him as a thief. You've read that many times. John 10 and 10, Jesus said, uh, the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, to destroy, right? But in contrast, I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. That word life is abundant in quantity, superior in quality. So we understand that this is Satan's nature. It is his intention to steal, to kill, and destroy. So anything uh, that falls under that category, you and I as believers can readily identify its author and its source. Amen. So here's Jehoshaphat, man. He's living life. He's serving God. He's realigned himself. And all of a sudden, man, an unexpected situation occurs that is very intimidating from the natural perspective. Verse 2, we have some individuals coming in to expound to him in all detail <laughs> the severity of the situation. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is En Gedi. Basically, he said, they come in and they say, Sir, a large army uh, uh, from Edom, east of the Dead Sea, they have invaded our country, and sir, uh, the terrible news is they've already reached En Gedi. They're basically at our back door. Now, we're always going to have those who, you know, come to once again give us all the details of how severe the situation is, right? <laughs> they want us to understand very clearly. That would be like you and I maybe perhaps uh, getting a bad report from a doctor or a banker or something to do with our business, or our employer, or family, or maybe uh, something that may arise, as we said, in the context of this year. Basically, man, it's big and it's bad, right? And you know, one of the main strategies of the enemy is that the onset of a situation, or if we would like to term it battle, or adversity, or attack, he loves to use what I call the intimidation factor. He wants you and I to perceive that mountain as immovable, impossible, impassable, all with the intention of bringing fear. 
Because, as you know, when fear is operative, then faith is inoperative. But one of the things that I have learned along my journey, uh, in the battles that I've faced personally, and also those of my family and close associates, is that my initial response to a situation can have tremendous impact on the outcome. If I respond in fear, then basically I open the door to the destruction and the loss that is associated with that attack. But if I respond in faith and confidence based upon the relationship that I know I share with Almighty God as a son, as a child, if I respond to that situation based upon the promises and provisions of His Word and the authority of His name, then I potentially sabotage the intended effects of that attack. So we say reaction determines result. Reaction determines result. I remember my mother, uh, she was 50 years old. She began to have pain behind her right eye and her, her eye was visibly beginning to protrude. And so uh, she went into the doctor and the doctor said, listen, we need to put you in the, uh, the hospital and run some tests. She was a sweet, wonderful Baptist uh, woman, raised me to love the Lord, you know. And so she's there in the hospital. They run tests. The doctor comes in that morning. My dad's in the cafeteria eating breakfast. My mother's there alone. The doctor said, Miss Blackwater, I'm so sorry to tell you, but we found a large tumor behind uh, your right eye. It's protruding into your brain. Uh, this type of tumor, uh, because of its location, it's very tedious to, to get to. We probably will not be able to extract uh, the totality of the tumor. And unfortunately, if not, it will grow back. Uh, when we go in, you'll probably or potentially can have loss of sight, loss of memory, short-term memory, and, uh, you know, uh, physical disfiguration and, and a long protracted recovery period. My mother said when he spoke those words, that's like they came in and said, sir, an army has invaded. Words are carriers. We, we know that. They carry substance. They can carry life and peace and joy and hope and confidence. Or they can carry fear and doubt and, and despair and discouragement. My mom said when he spoke this word, those words, he, she said, son, this cloud uh, of fear enveloped me. And she said in a moment I could just see all the things he said coming into fruition. You know, the enemy will help our imagination. <laughs> but she said, baby, all of a sudden, up from the inside of me came these words. Oh, no, you don't. I will not fear in the name of Jesus. She said, the doctor said, excuse me. And she said, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> and she said, honey, all of a sudden, that fear dissipated and the peace of God enveloped me and I knew everything was going to be all right. And friends, can I say, tell you, it was we, her faith was to have the surgery. We did what the Bible says. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes understanding will keep your heart and your minds through Christ Jesus. So we let our petitions known. Father, they'll get all of the, all of the tumor. It'll never grow back. There'll be no loss of sight. No loss of memory. No gross physical disfiguration. And a quick and speedy recovery. She came out of the surgery. They didn't know if she'd say goo goo ga ga or what. She said her first words were, isn't God good? And every one of those petitions were answered. Praise God. Amen. So reaction can determine a result. Now initially, everybody say initially. Jehoshaphat uh, responded to the situation like many times we're tempted to do. The Bible says he feared. Verse 3, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. 
Now, guys, all of us can be tempted to fear when an unexpected situation uh, arises. But being tempted to fear and sensing its initial impact on your emotions and your mind is different than giving place to fear and allowing it uh, to consume us. The Bible says over 365 times, as you well know, fear not. That's one for every day of the week. Woo! Or every day of the year, I guess we'd say. <laughs> so when the battles of life surface, and maybe unexpected situations arise, it's very important to resist the temptation to panic. And to begin to, to respond to a situation emotionally. And of course, uh, in anxiety. So you and I realize that fear is a spirit and it must be resisted. Now, I'm not talking about natural preservational fear when you're on the side of a cliff and everything's saying, hey man, be careful, watch your step. That's what we call natural preservational fear. I'm talking about the kind of fear that torments, that keeps us awake at night that influences our decisions in life, that causes us to question or have a sense of uncertainty about our future or our health or our abilities. That kind of fear is a spirit. And it must be resisted because it can have tremendous impact on our lives. That's why the scripture says in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear. But what has he given us? Power, love, and a sound mind. He's given us three to the devil's one. Woo! Amen. <laughs> so initially, man, he fears. But then he made a very wise and productive choice. Notice verse 3 again. He set himself to seek the Lord. And proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. Now notice, he begins to seek God not casually, but earnestly and diligently. And this is very, very important in our life of faith as we navigate uh, this, this world and we navigate our paths. Uh, we follow this example. He got control of his emotions. He got the fear under control. He turned his attention away from the approaching army and he set his attention on God and he began to seek God for a solution. You know, sometimes in our walks of faith, we have what I call mechanical responses. You know what I mean? As just as faith people, we can have mechanical responses. Now, don't get me wrong. We should always respond to every adverse situation that is contrary to the promises and provisions of God, contrary to a life abundant, with His Word, with the authority that He has invested in that Word, with the authority of Jesus' name, yes, respond with that, with God's Word. Stand upon it. Declare it. But in addition, we should always make ourselves available for his counsel and for his direction and for his input. Are you with me? We have a helper. His name's the Holy Spirit. And sometimes he will direct us to do certain things in conjunction with our faith that will effectively bring the answer and the outcome to a victorious end. So it's not always, you know, just one, two, three. Every battle is unique and uh, many times requires a different approach. So when we're facing situations, maybe you're facing some this morning and whatever may arise this year, although I'm not looking for it, but if it arises, <laughs> right? I'm going to certainly stand on God's word, but I'm also going to let my father know I'm depending on you. I'm looking to you and I'm listening to you for any instruction you may wish to give. Because James chapter uh, 1 and verse 5, you know the scripture. If any of you lacks wisdom, let's ask of God 
who gives liberally without reproach, and it will be given him. He knows what to do in every situation, and we can save ourselves a lot of, uh, of you know, time and frustration. I remember, and I was a relatively young man. I still am. I met Pastor when I was 12. Just kidding. But uh, anyway, man, you know, I was, I was having chronic pain in my body, in my joints, uh, knees, just in general. You know, and I'm, I'm a young guy at that time. So I'm getting up and, man, I had to get going. Wow, what in the world? So I know the word. I prayed the word. I've claimed the promise. I'm standing, right? Nothing's changing. So I said, honey, I'm going to fast and pray just like <laughs> they did. I want to get the answer here. So I went and I began to seek God. Lord, what do I need to do to add to my faith here? Obviously, there's something. So I'm fasting and praying. Well, honest, I, God is my witness out of my spirit. Is you know, many times you say an impression or a leading, but it, it came up out of my belly. Now you're going to laugh. You're drinking too much, Dr. Pepper. Now listen to me. At that time, I loved Dr. Pepper. And I drank it every day and lots of it. I just liked it. I was young. I didn't think anything about it. He said, you're drinking too much, Dr. Pepper. That was all I got. I come busting out of the, out of the <laughs> bedroom. I said, honey, she's in the kitchen. I said, the Lord said, I'm drinking too much, Dr. Pepper. She said, well, I could have told you that. <laughs> so did you know what I did? I, I got wisdom. I stopped it completely. I went on water, water. I'm still a water guy today. And I'm telling you, God is my witness. Within a few weeks or so, all of that completely dissipated. Now I've learned it was causing inflammation because of the sugar, which I didn't know. <laughs> but he did. Woo! And I can do what I need to do. <laughs> Glory to God. So sometimes there's some natural adjustments we can make in correspondence with our faith and the Holy Spirit will enlighten us. Okay. So we know we're all in different places with our faith at different times. God knows the answer. And he will help us take the path that will best suit us in conjunction with our faith to come to the victorious end. Sometimes we just need more information. I remember a story Brother Hagen told uh, one time where there was a woman in his church. And she had, I'm, I'm quite certain it was breast cancer. So they have prayed for her. They've laid hands upon her. Uh, and, and there's no change. And finally, you know, she was getting to where she was bedridden. So he likewise took this example. He said, I got some prayer warriors from the church. And we went over to her house and we fasted and prayed for three days. Now, I don't know if that was consistently or went home, spent the night and, come and came back. But three days prayer and fasting. He said, on the third day, the Holy, I'm praying in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, go stand at the bottom of her bed. Point your finger at her and command the spirit of death or infirmity. Uh, I'm trying to look. I think infirmity to come out of her in Jesus name. He said, well, I'd never done that. But I went to the bottom of the bed and I pointed my finger and I said, in the name of Jesus, I command that spirit of infirmity to come out of you. He said, all of a sudden he saw in the spirit realm, this thing like a black bat rose up out of her chest beady red eyes, and flew out the window. And she rose up instantly healed. Now, what does that tell us? Sometimes the prayer of faith needs to be accompanied with a manifestation of the Spirit. And God knew that. There was a spirit of infirmity enforcing the disease. That's not always the case. But in this situation, it was discerned, it was taken care of, and she got up, went outside and ate watermelon with them, totally healed. Praise God. So we're simply saying, let's get the mind of Christ. Let's seek God for a solution. Amen? Because there is one. I believe that none of us are assigned to defeat. No matter what our level of spiritual development or faith may be, there's a path to victory and God can help us get there. So always be open to his instruction. And don't look down on yourself because he tells you to have a procedure. If that's what he tells you to do, do it. 
and add your faith to it. Are you with me? <laughs> Jesus told Brother Hagin, I don't know if you know who he is, but Ken Hagin, I traveled with him 11 years. He had many visitations of the Lord. And he told Brother Hagin, he said, now listen, always pray for my children. If they're under the care of a doctor in the hospital or having a procedure, that I will assist in the healing and recovering process. And he said, I'll do it. So you can have confidence in any arena uh, where you're applying your faith. Are you with me? Now we know we're healed by the stripes of Jesus. That is God's provision. But we also know we have a helper and a leader. And we're going to listen to his leading. All right? So verses 4 and 6. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule over the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Now notice, he doesn't begin his prayer with, oh God, what are we going to do? That's not the appropriate protocol for answered prayer. <laughs> Is it? Man, he starts talking about how awesome God is. Aren't you the God in heaven? Don't you rule over the kingdoms of men? Is there anyone that can defy you? And man, when we're facing situations, that's what we need to do. Rise up on the inside and remind yourself of what God has spoken. God said, no weapon formed against you will prosper. I will contend with those that contend with you. Your enemies may rise up against you one way, but they will flee before you seven. The enemy may come in like a flood, but the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Because you have made me, the Lord, your refuge, even the Most High, your habitation, no evil will befall you. No plague will come nigh your dwelling. He will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. In your pathway is life. They'll bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Oh, he said, because you've set your love upon me, I will deliver you. I will set you on high because you've known my name. You will call upon me, he said. I will answer. I will be with you in trouble. I will deliver you. And with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. Woo! That doesn't light your fire. Your wood's wet. Amen. <laughs> Woo! We got to remind ourselves <laughs> who he is, what he said. Verse 7 now, and you, are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence for your name is in this temple. How many of you know his name is in this temple? Woo! And cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and save. And now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. And here they are, rewarding us by coming uh, to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. Oh God, will you not judge them? We have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, their children, they stood before the Lord. Man, there's a lot going on in these verses. 
But first of all, what we saw and see in verse 7 is Jehoshaphat begins to emphasize covenant. Are you not our God? Are we not your people? You have a personal interest here. And man, that should give every single one of us an extreme sense of confidence as a New Testament believer. Father, I belong to you. Woo! And all of the promises and provisions of the covenant that has been provided through the death, burial, and resurrection and shed blood of Jesus Christ belongs to us and no devil in hell is going to keep us from possessing it. Anybody with me? Woo! So he begins to emphasize covenant and then he starts rehearsing past victories. Did you know that's a good thing to do when we're facing a current situation and man, the temptation is to get a little overwhelmed? Start reflecting. He said, hey, remember when you brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and ultimately into this land and how you drove out their enemies before them? And now we possess this land, right? Go back like David did. He said, man, I fought the lion. I fought the bear. This Philistine will be like one of these. You and I need to remind ourselves of past victories because it will encourage us now, right? So he does that. And uh, he emphasizes covenant. He begins to reflect upon past victories. And then, of course, you know, he begins to, as we say, a reason with God. I didn't give this scripture, but the Bible says in Isaiah 43 and 26, I'll just give you the reference. You can write it down. Come, let us reason together. God doesn't mind us talking with him about a situation. And so he basically begins to plead his case. Hey, you told them. To leave these guys alone when we took the land. And now the very ones that you told us to leave alone are coming to dispossess us from the land. <laughs> right? He's pleading his case, man. And so, verse 12 now. He's simply saying we're looking to you to rectify the situation. Verse 12, oh our God, will you not judge them? We have no power in the natural, you know, against this great multitude that's coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And guys, that's where our eyes need to stay. Now, and as we navigate the year and the potential years ahead of us, should the Lord tarry, let's keep our eyes on the one who's faithful. Are you with me? Our eyes are on you. And that's exactly where they need to be, as we stated. So Jehoshaphat understood that in and of themselves, they were facing a hopeless situation. And they didn't have all the answers, but they were looking to the one who did. So where are we now in the story? Is this a good story? Woo! They received a challenging report. Jehoshaphat stilled his emotions. He resisted the fear. He began to reflect upon the promises of God, the faithfulness of God, the power of God, the dominion of God. Amen? The covenant that he had with God, the greatness of God. And he began to plead his case. And then he set himself to seek God and to listen for his counsel. And verse 14, God begins to respond through a man named Jehaziel by the spirit of prophecy. And this is what he gave him as the battle plan for success. Verse 15, he said, listen, all you Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's. Woo! Man, that's comforting. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid in, on the playground, if you got in a tussle with somebody, you know, uh, and you were losing, 
you'd get up and you'd start talking about your daddy. My daddy is six foot two. He'll whip you and your daddy. You remember you used to talk about your daddy. <laughs> oh, that's what we do. Woo. Man, let me tell you, you ever seen two boxers before a pregame match? They're standing at each other like this. They're going to do the interview. Let me tell you something you will never see. And if you do, just turn the television off. You will never see one of those guys when they say, well, how do you feel about the match, sir? Well, I don't know. I'll be honest with you, man. I'm nervous. That guy, look at him. He's huge. Is that what they say? Even if they're shaking on the inside, man. They say, I'm going to eat his lunch. I'm going to take him down. This, this match is mine. <laughs> right? That's what we do. When we face the battles, we stand in a position of confidence, and then we listen. Now listen. Where were we? Where are we? In the story. The, Fifteen. Do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude. The battle's not yours, it's God's. That's where we were. Hey man, he's our father. And he's backing us up, overshadowing us. Amen. Fighting our battles for us in a sense. He's already won. But we know sometimes we've got to walk it out. So, perhaps God's saying that to somebody this morning. Hey, I got you. Everything's going to be all right. Amen. The battle's not yours. It's mine. I can take care of it, God say. So he continues, verse 16, tomorrow go down against them. They'll come up by the ascent of Ziz. He tells them exactly where to find the enemy. And you'll find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeru. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them. The Lord is with you. Man, that's awesome. He said, hey, you won't even need to fight in this battle. It's not going to be by your uh, natural uh, skills or your skillful warfare. Your natural abilities. We're going to handle this thing in a different realm. Set yourselves, position yourselves, stand still. Sometimes, man, we get in a tizzy, want to do all. God said, hey, 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 stand still. Woo, I got this. <laughs> 18. Jehoshaphat bowed his head and his face to the ground, and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. Sometimes you just got to get a little loud. Woo! You got to let the devil know you mean business, right? So they begin to worship God. They begin to praise Him in a loud voice. Now watch, here we go, verse 20. So they rose early in the morning. And they went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. So man, they began to move out in faith, not really knowing how in the world God was going to defeat this innumerable company. Now that's faith. And as they went, Jehoshaphat said, Hey, believe in God and believe what he said. Woo! Verse 21. When he consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. And we're saying, praise the Lord, for His mercy endures forever. Now, can you imagine putting the praise and worship team out front and the army with all the spears and swords and shields are back here? Don't you know there was a lot of choir members missing that morning? <laughs> Mr. Jehoshaphat, my voice is bothering me today. 
I think I better stay back here. <laughs> no, they believed. They may have been a little, you know, anxious on the inside, but they're like, I believe what God has spoken through His Word by His prophets. We're going to move forward. And they start praising Him. <laughs> Man, that's faith. They had no natural weapons. No way of defending themselves from this army in the natural. All they were carrying into this battle was the, was the, were the garments of praise. Woo! What's that teach us this morning? As we navigate personal situations and anything that may arise, what do we learn? When the battle comes, once we have declared God's promises, stood upon His word, inquired of Him, received His wisdom, received His instruction, and positioned ourselves in a place of confidence. All that, left, all that is left or remains is to praise Him for the victory. And I know you've heard that concept, but friends, it is a reality. There's power in praise. Notice verse 22. Now when they began to sing and to praise the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. And it was when, not before, but when they began to sing and to praise God that the activation occurred, that God began to do what He was doing, and those enemies uh, began to be destroyed. We see this over and over uh, regarding praise in the Old Testament. Joshua, the battle of Jericho. You remember the story? Israel and the Philistines. Gideon and the Midianites. There's something about praising God. Not mere external commotion, but praise from the heart. There's power in praise. Psalm uh, 22 and 3 uh, it says in that particular scripture that God is enthroned on the praises of Israel. Well, enthroned means that you're inhabiting, you're sitting, you're present. Well, if he is enthroned or inhabits the praises of Israel back in that day, how much more the praises of his sons and his daughters. So it's like pulling a trigger and a deluge of God's power and provision and help and assistance is released. Amen? So, here's what happens. Verse 23, they start praising. They release the deluge. They pull the trigger. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. Are you getting the picture? Moab... And the Ammonites, they're coming to destroy Judah. But they turn on each other. You talk about delusion. And they start eradicating each other. Or excuse me, they start eradicating the inhabitants of Mount Seir. So both of them gang up on the inhabitants of Mount Seir. Wipe them out and then they turn on each other. <laughs> Good gracious, man. You want to put some confusion in the enemy's camp? Start praising God. Now, the, the cool thing about this is that Jehoshaphat and the armies of Judah or the people and the praisers that were, were, were coming forward, they had no visual. They're on the other side of this mountain ridge. They have no idea what's happening on the other side of that mountain ridge. All they know is God said we wouldn't have to fight that we were to sing praise unto Him and to move forward in faith. And that's what we're going to do. And when they began to do that over here, God began to activate their victory over there. They had no visual. They had no idea what was going on. They're just praising God in faith. Woo. Now watch 20, 24. So when Judah came to the place overlooking the wilderness, 
They looked toward the multitude and there were dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. Can you imagine coming up over that mountain ridge? Not praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. On the inside. <laughs> praise the Lord probably. <laughs> and they look over that thing. And man, everybody's dead. When God does something, he does it right. Complete victory. He finishes the job. And sometimes things are done in such a way that are unexplainable in the natural. They're beyond human ability so that only God gets the glory for it. This morning, God doesn't want to just give us enough victory. Right? Barely enough. He doesn't want to just defeat our enemy or solve our problem. He wants to give us exceeding abundantly. Above. Amen. Abundant victory. Overflowing victory. Verse 25. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies. Obviously, these guys were coming to stay a while. In their mind, hey, we're going to take occupancy. Let's bring everything we're going to need. So they brought it all. They had no idea they were bringing it for God's folk. Woo! Precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering the spoil because there was so much. Man. Judah had three nations come against him. All the odds were against him. Their only hope was in God. They looked to him. They believed him. They listened to him. They obeyed him. And they praised him. And as a result, he helped them. He fought for them. And he supplied them with such an amazing spoil, it took them three days to carry it all off. Woo! And in verses 26 through 30, we'll not look there, we see them assembled together as a nation standing in awe of the God of Judah. And all the nations round about them, likewise, saying, whoops, we better not mess with these guys. <laughs> There's no God like theirs. So, Brother Marty, in light of what has been seen, what's been shared uh, concerning the coming year, once again, what's your expectation? Well, my expectation, and likewise should be yours, as we've already stated, is to be blessed. Empowered, joy-filled, sustained, and miraculously thrive even if the world around us is tossed with a great tempest. How are we going to do that? By implementing the principles that were set forth in this particular story. No matter what may arise, you and I are going to respond appropriately in faith. In confidence, not in fear or timidity. Because why? Reaction determines result. We're going to seek God for his wisdom and his leadership in every situation. We're going to stand firmly upon the covenant that we possess. Upon the promises that he has made us. And the provisions he has given us in Christ. And we're going to remind ourselves of who he is and who we are because of him. And we're going to reflect upon our past victories to give us confidence in the here and now. And we're going to keep our eyes on Him. Now I can't see anything because I looked up in those lights. And we're going to praise Him <laughs> for the victory. Man, I'm not at the least bit afraid or concerned. I'm thankful to be enlightened so that I'm aware and I realize some things could Occur, but I'm not concerned about it because the battle's not mine, it's the Lord's. And we have the victory in Christ. Everybody say, I've got the victory. So let's remember the words of the pilot, ladies and gentlemen. There's some turbulence ahead. We will arise, arrive safely. But please keep your seats. And your seat belts fastened. So what are we going to do? We're going to keep our seat. 
in heavenly places, in Christ, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named. We're going to keep our seat of authority, keep our seat of dominion. Woo! And we're going to keep our seat belts buckled, full of faith, full of peace, full of joy, full of confidence, full of the Word, full of the Holy Ghost, and navigate successfully. Anybody with me? And we're going to miraculously thrive. I like that part. Even if the world around us is tossed with a tempest. You ever swallowed your own saliva? Dear Lord, have mercy. Everybody stand up in the house. Woo! Now, it just seemed good to me in the Holy Ghost today that we should end this time like they did. With a little praise. Now, you may be visiting this morning and you've never been in a church like this. If you don't like the service, you come on back. I'm not the pastor. I'm just visiting. You can blame it on me. But if you're visiting, you know, I just invite you to join in. Now, some of you got, you know, you need to blow the cobwebs out this morning. I can just tell. And there's something about praising God and particularly in the shout, you know. You know, they say for it, the, with the detergent for the tough stains, you got to shout it out. <laughs> Sometimes, man, you just got to lift your voice and give a good shout, you know. So wait a minute, wait a minute, because here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I, know, I appreciate your enthusiasm, because I like that. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. And when I do on three, I want us to do what you just did. I want us to lift a corporate shout of praise. Now listen, this, is, this praise is on purpose. We're praising God in advance. That no matter what your present situation this morning may be, maybe you prayed your prayer, you're standing in faith, you haven't seen your answer yet. Well, we're going to praise Him for it. But then we're also praising God as a declaration of victory. 2024. We're going to be blessed, empowered, sustained. Amen. Miraculously thrive. <laughs> no matter what may unfold in the world. So that's our victory shout of praise in advance. You say, well, I've never shouted before. Well, now's your opportunity. Nobody's going to be looking at you. Just put your head back and let her rip. Amen. <laughs> because listen, the Psalms is full of shouting. I mean verse after verse. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Shout unto God, all you righteous. I mean over and over and over. Anybody ready to praise Him? Yeah. Aren't you guys ready? Yeah. All right. One. Now listen, we're going to scare every devil in one of Roberts. We're going to let them know we're alive and well, and we're moving forward. What do you need this morning? Praise Him in advance for it. I don't care what the situation may be. And once again, this isn't formalism or emotionalism. This is powerful. Praise activates the power of God when it comes from the heart of a person who is truly praising Him. Are you ready? One, two, three. Come on. Hallelujah.